In the beginning, the earth was a dark, empty blob. God spoke and created the entire world. Light, sky, fish, birds, and animals. Then God said, let us make human beings in our own image. God then put Adam in a garden where there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eventually, God caused the man to fall asleep, took out one of his ribs, and created a woman who Adam named Eve. Later, a serpent came and convinced Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying they would become like God if they did. Eve took a bite, and then so did Adam. Because of this choice, God cursed the serpent as well as Adam and Eve and forced them out of the garden, away from the tree of life. Outside the garden, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. When they made sacrifices, God accepted Abel's sacrifices of animals, but not Cain's sacrifice of crops. This made Cain so angry that he murdered Abel. People began to populate the entire earth, and wickedness and tragedy continued to spread. God found one man, Noah, who walked faithfully. So God instructed Noah to build a giant boat called an ark, and to take his entire family, along with a male and female of every kind of animal, onto the boat. For 40 days it rained, and the entire earth was flooded, wiping out every living thing. Eventually, the flood stopped, and the ark came to rest on dry land. And God made a promise that the entire earth would never again be completely flooded. God put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of this promise, and God looked for someone who God could use to bless the entire world. This is a way for us to review what we went through last week. And then this week we're in chapter two, and everybody read chapter two this past week, right? You're all, ooh, right? You don't want to be behind in the second week. That's just too early to be falling behind. So make sure that you catch up if, you're, if you are behind, and you'll be discussing it in your groups this week. We also put a bookmark in your, in your uh, folder, and you might say, I got one of those already last week. Well, this one, the other one had a mistake in it and got the weeks all goofed up. So you want to make sure you replace it with the one that is correct. We have a chance this second week to see how God begins to build a nation in a most unusual way through one guy who doesn't have any kids. And he makes some promises to him, and we see that Abraham actually, by faith, believes some things, and he becomes actually someone who the New Testament, after the time of Christ, began to refer back to as a model for faith in terms of how we should live our own life today. In fact, in Romans chapter 4, it says this, It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promises that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, here's the reality, men and women, is that people have always been saved the same way. They've been saved by faith. But what they place their faith in has changed as God has progressively revealed his salvation story until ultimately being fulfilled in the time of Christ. It goes on to say in Romans chapter 4, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Watch this. Not only to those who are of the law, the Jews, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So it begins to say that in the New Testament, as he looks, they look back on the faith of Abraham, that actually his faith was the beginning point for a nation to begin and a salvation plan to unfold in such a way where finally Christ came. And now our faith needs to be placed not in the same thing that Abraham had, but we place it in Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, what happens is, as you've read the story, that some of you, all of you are going to get to it, but um, some of you didn't get to it quite. But as you read chapter 2, you're reading beginning in Genesis chapter 12, and you're reading and hearing the, the story of Abraham unfold. As it does, 
the, um, the writers of the story have interjected into it New Testament verses out of Hebrews chapter 11, which is called the Hall of Faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, four things are said about Abraham. And I want to take those four things to kind of use as benchmarks, um, maybe litmus tests for us to see if our faith is heading in the same kind of direction. Make sense? Now, also a couple of things. First, if you haven't stuck your name tag on the story, you want to make sure that you do that. If you're in with us and you're going to track along with us, make sure that you do that. Secondly, thanks for those of you who came out on Friday for the prospect football game and the tailgating that we had. Great food, great fun. Thanks for coming out. It was, I think it was a real encouragement um, to, the, to the school and to the players there and everybody else. We had a big crowd, biggest crowd they've had in years, I heard. So that was great. Finally, I don't know if you're paying attention, but there's a dynasty being built up right among us. San Jose State is now 3-1, and one, and they won in San Diego yesterday for the first time in 60 years. So any state people here, way to go. There were three guys from the football team here last service, so well done. It's, it's, a, um, it's very cool to see state coming on, and um, guys, pay attention. There's another team in town, and you want to make sure that you pay attention to what's going on there. Okay, let me pray for us. And we're going to jump into chapter 2 of the story. God, thank you that there is freedom where your spirit is present. And that your spirit is present based on the promises. That wherever you're invited and wherever two or more gather, you're here in a special, powerful way. We need your presence more than anything. We depend on your spirit to be our teacher. God, you know, this morning I'm kind of doped up on Dayquil, and so I need your help. I need this, need this to be clear. Holy Spirit, get me out of the way and teach us today that we may be people of great faith. Thank you. Thank you that the object of our faith is so very clear in Jesus Christ. Thank you for such great and willing sacrifice for us that we may have life in him. And we commit our time to you in his wonderful and matchless name. Amen. So as I said, Hebrews 11 says four things about faith. Each of those things I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to try to talk to you and give you some kind of a sign in terms of how I look at them or a, an illustration. And the first one, sorry, I don't have the iPhone 5 yet. I didn't stand in line. But I do have the iPhone 4, and it has an app on it that has a, a compass. This is a, and when, I, when you think of this first part of faith, I want you to think compass. And it's the way of faith. The way of faith is a compass, not a map. Look what it says about Abraham. Page 14 on the story, and it's Hebrews 11:8 that they quote. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance obeyed and went, watch this, even though he did not know where he was going. God said, I want you to go that way. Can you imagine being his wife? We're moving. Where? That way? What's out there? Uh, no say. I mean, it, it's just the imagine the, the part of it is that God many, many times, in fact, most times, in fact, all of the time in my own life, he only gives me small amounts of information and asks me to obey. That's why they call it faith. He says to me, I'd like for you to leave coaching and go into the pastorate. I thought maybe a few years. I'd like you to leave your home, Texas, and come to California. What's there? Like for you to leave Santa Cruz, come to San Jose. In each of those ventures, think about this. Just forget about those moves. In your own life, for those of you who are married, to going from being single to being married, there's so much you didn't know. Thank God Dana didn't know or she'd have never married me. There's so much about being married, you had no idea that that was in. That was what's going on. The job that you have now, had you known the full scoop, it's a chance you wouldn't have taken it. We do this all the time, but, but as Americans, we want more of the information. We want all the, all the, come back. Wow, that was a good catch. Watch out, I'm quick. We want all our I's dotted. We want all our T's crossed. We want all the itinerary filled in. 
And I want to tell you, that's, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have a plan and to work that plan and to have a budget and to work that budget. But most of the time, when God calls you out in faith, he's not going to give you all that information. There's going to be some stuff you just don't know. And he's asking you to trust him and to move out in that way. So when you think about the way of faith, many of you, I believe, I believe that there are many people in this room that have already been given enough information for the next faith venture in your life, but you're waiting for more information. And I hate to tell you this, you ain't gonna get it. God has said, I want you to trust me and go that way. Yeah, but God, what about this? What about this? That way. Trust me, and I'll show you as you need to know it what you need to know. Hard steps, but faith, think compass, not a map. When you move out in faith, the way of faith is like a compass. The second thing we see in Hebrews, it comes out in verse 9, where it says, Hebrews 11, 9, by faith... Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. In in the King James Version, it says, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise. I love that word sojourned. It means resides temporarily. And whenever you think about the place of faith, I want you to think about a passport. Because we are told in the New Testament in the teachings of Scripture, that this is not our home. We are strangers and aliens, citizens of another place. And the way of faith may be a compass, but the place of faith is never where you eventually arrive on this planet. Now, this is a strong tendency among us, that we kind of go along and find a place and we sink deep roots into it. We build relationships. We, we establish that this is the place that we like and we, we pretty much are hard to get rooted out of that. Just talk to somebody in the last service and they love living here, but they are convinced that God is asking them to move to a different place. And it's much easier if you can think about a passport and think about the reality that this is not your home. You are sojourners, temporarily residing as God prepares you for a better place. Texans are a little bit weird about this whole thing because we're, we're really proud about being from Texas, which is a strange thing because there's not much there to be proud of. <laughs> it's flat, mostly ugly, compared to a lot of places on the planet. But we can, we can sink our roots. I almost didn't come here because I wanted to live in Texas. And I'm in my 12th year here now, and I think, oh God, what I would have missed, what I would have missed that you've done in my life to be a part of y'all and part of this community had I been hard-headed about where my home needed to be. Some of y'all are waiting for more information, and you're not going to get it. Some of you are saying no to a faith venture because you're really comfortable where you're at, and God will ask you to move, and you have to be willing. Not just willing in terms of where you have your residence. Sometimes he'll ask you just to move into a place of uncomfortableness with a change of a job or just maybe going across the street and talking to somebody. The place of faith is that we is not here on this planet. We are citizens of another place. This is not the land of the living. It's the land of the dying. And we are called to be partners and to be citizens of the land of the living. So the way of faith is a compass. God help them. God, please. (laughs) Maybe it'll help you if I hold it up. The way of faith is a compass, and the place of faith is a passport. Now, the object of faith, this is the one that's absolutely critical. The object of faith is a branch. Now, let me share this with you, and then I think it'll make more sense. But first, you've got to understand that Abraham is declared righteous because he places faith in what has been revealed to him. What is it that Abraham has to believe in faith? That God will take a dried up old man and turn him into the father of a great nation. That's a hard thing to grasp. It was hard for him. It took a lot of years for him to get his hands around it. But it says that he believed God could do it. And it was credited to him as righteous. 
Righteousness. What is it that you're to believe for righteousness? That Jesus Christ came, lived on the planet, lived a perfect life, bore the penalty of the sin of mankind on Calvary's cross, and three days later rose from the dead. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ. And you've got to get this one right. It says this in Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone, let me say that again, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile for the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The object of our faith is Christ. Now, why did I choose a branch? It's because of this quote that I want to share with you. Tim Keller gives us this illustration. I think it's wonderful. You have to use your imagination. Are you ready? You ready? Okay, thanks. Thank you. I don't know about y'all, but we're ready over here. So here we go. Imagine you're falling off a cliff and sticking out of the cliff is a branch that is strong enough to hold you. But you don't know how strong it is as you're falling. You have just enough time to grab that branch. How much faith do you have to have in the branch for it to save you? Must you be totally sure that it can save you? No, of course not. You only have to have enough faith to grab the branch branch. Watch this. This is important because it's not the quality of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith. Doesn't matter how you feel about the branch. All that matters is the branch. And Jesus is the branch. I I talk to people all the time and they say, you know, faith's not working for me because I still have all kinds of doubts. I've got all kinds of questions that haven't been answered yet. And I just look at him and say, (laughs) welcome to the party. (laughs) Doubt is the bedfellow of faith. It was always something that goes along. That's why it's called faith. All your questions won't be answered. Listen, I've got questions that have yet to be answered. I don't think they'll be answered this side of heaven. I'm asked to, by faith, believe that Jesus as the branch will hold on to me and not let me fall. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so I, I just, I just want to make sure that your faith is, a, is an admirable quality, but it's not enough. Faith itself does not save. It's, in, it's the object of your faith that saves you. And Jesus Christ, is, it's enough to just look and say, life, I can't work life out on my own. I cannot be good enough to earn a God who's perfect, his standard. I am trusting in God's way through Jesus Christ as my only way of salvation. I'm hanging on to that branch best I can. All the questions aren't answered. All the doubts are not erased. But the resurrection is real. And I'm clinging to it. So, the way of faith is a compass. Very good, thank you. The place of faith is a passport. The object of our faith, think about a branch, as Christ is our branch. And I wish I could stop here. I wish I could just stop and say, this is it. Just make sure that you, you understand that there's sometimes you won't have all your questions answered, that God's going to call you to a place. He won't give you enough information. I wish I could tell you that as you do that along the way, that, that remember that your citizenship is not in this, on this world and, and hold things loosely. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus Christ and walk by faith. But here's the deal. If I'm a decent teacher and I give you information that says, here's, way, here's the information you're going to need to know, here's the place it's going to be ap- applicable, and here's the person you've got to put your faith in, I'm going to bring something along in your life to see if that faith is really operational, right? What's that called? A test. 
that, that doesn't make the teacher a, a bad teacher. It doesn't make them mean. It makes them effective. And it's also reassuring for the student to say to themselves, I passed the test, I understand that my faith is growing. And so the last part about faith is the test of faith. It shows up in the story on page 20, Hebrews 11, 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Can you, now just imagine that for a minute. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. God, you've finally done this miracle of providing the son of promise. It was such a joyous thing that they named him laughter. And then the the symbol of all of the promises that you have made, the symbol of all the things that I've placed my faith in, you're asking me to give him up? Now this is, I would be less than faithful as your pastor if I didn't tell you this. God will sometimes in your journey of faith, he will seem illogical and unreasonable in some of the things he asks of you. I wish I could tell you it wasn't true, but it is. In my own life, the symbol of my test of faith is my son Clay, who six months ago yesterday physically died and went to be in the presence of heaven. Now I'm not saying that God took Clay to test my faith. Please don't hear me that, hear saying that. But what I am saying is that, that God taking clay home has surely tested my faith. It seems illogical. It seems unreasonable. But I will tell you that the outworking of this faith, the... the the pouring out of this test in my life over the last six months is that the resurrection has never been more real for me and that heaven has never been more anticipated for me. Don't worry, I'm not suicidal. (laughs) But I'm looking forward to going home in a way that I never have. Sometimes life will suck Hard. And in those times, you believe. In those times, you say, this is unreasonable, this is illogical, I'm not happy. But I trust you, God. I trust that your plans are good. And where else would I go? There is a journey of faith. Most of you are missing it because you're not willing to walk into some of the unknown. God is asking you, trust me, trust me, trust me. I am good, I am faithful. You can depend on me. But don't go into that journey thinking that it's all going to be roses once you say yes to God. Don't be so deceived by the health and wealth prosperity bull that God will make you healthy and wealthy and happy and sassy. He is about making you a person of great faith that walks and lives and loves like his son, Jesus Christ. And that journey sometimes is really but it is always good. Here's a quote by a guy named Tullian Chavijan, I think is how you say his last name. When we depend on anything smaller than God to provide us with the security, significance, meaning, and value that we long for, 
God will love us enough to take it away. Much of our anger and bitterness, therefore, is God prying open our hands and and taking away something that we've held on to more tightly than him. Now, again, I am not saying that God took clay away because I was holding him too tightly. But I am telling you, I have never clung to God like I have now. I hope, I, I don't share this with you to help, to to make you feel sad or to be sorry for me. I share this with you because I long for you to be people of great, deep faith. And I can't just tell you that, to just trust him and go. I have to warn you that you're going. When he go, he's going to lead you by faith into a battlefield, a place where an enemy seeks to devour you. He promises. He promises with every word of the story and every word of his ancient text. He will be with us. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will uphold you with my righteous, strong right arm. I long for you to live in that journey of faith where unless God shows up, you will certainly fail. Communion is a statement about that same promise, the wonderful covenant, the new covenant in Jesus Christ that declares that we are trusting, we are believing in the body of Christ broken for us, in the blood of Christ spilled for us for the forgiveness of sin, that righteousness is found in no other name. And that as we take these elements, we are making a statement of faith that we trust in Christ. We believe that he is, he is enough and that he will always be enough. That's why we, we tell you, if you're here and you're trusted, just checking out Christianity, we're thrilled that you're here, but you shouldn't take the elements because you'd be doing something that's hypocritical. You're proclaiming that you believe when you don't yet believe. We're thrilled that you're here. Just don't take the elements. It wouldn't be healthy for you. But I would also warn those of you who say you believe, don't take these elements just flippantly saying, let's get it done so we can go watch the game. You take these elements as a declaration before a holy God saying, I believe. Help my unbelief. I wish I were stronger. I believe. My faith is in you. Christ, I declare that until you come back, I will live as you have asked me to live by faith. So I invite you in this next time of worship that you would surrender into this journey of faith making sure that you know that the way of faith is a compass, not a map, that the place of faith is heaven, not here on earth, that the object of our faith is the branch which represents Jesus Christ, and that there will come a test, and then another, several tests, but they are there to buoy you up and make you strong. As you take these elements, as you declare Christ, your faith in him. Do an inventory of your faith. I believe there's somebody, there's some people in the room that are right on the verge of making some kind of a decision that seems a little stupid. But you think God's asking you to do something? I implore you, take a chance. Like the gal that I just talked to, I told you I just talked to someone, she says, God's calling me to Colorado. What's at risk? I ask her, you dating anybody? No. Can you get your job back? Yep. (laughs) Go. Go. What's at risk? You might like Colorado, and if you don't, just come on back. Maybe you'll get a date. (laughs) I I didn't say that to her, you know. (laughs) But we think that there's so much at risk, and why do we think that? Because we have placed so much value in this being our home. This is not our home. Walk by faith. Men and women, join me in this awesome journey. Hard, sucks sometimes. But it's a a journey worth joining. Use this time to evaluate where your faith is. Let me pray for us.
Thanks for the privilege of being your kids. Thanks for your patience with us. Thank you for such a clear demonstration of your love for us in Jesus Christ. It's against our nature, certainly against our culture, to walk by faith. We want more information. We like it here, sometimes way too much. And we certainly don't want the tests in our life. But I pray, God, you do a work in us. You do a work in me that would grow our faith, that we would trust you more. For those people who are considering stepping out and taking some risk, God, I pray you'd give them great faith. Help them to discern that it's from you. Help them to get good counsel from other people and then help them to take a risk and go. For those of us who have grabbed onto the things of this world too tightly, it's a hard thing to pray, God, but I, I ask that you'd pry our fingers loose. You'd help us to hold the blessings of this planet with open hands. For those in the room who are under a test, where their faith is being, like the scriptures say, being burnt up and the dross is being burnt and scraped away, and the furnace of the red hot things that you've got in their life, I pray you would pour strength and grace into them, that they would stand strong in you, that they would see very clearly your faithfulness, that you'd come through for them, that you'd move on their behalf as you promised you would. And then God, I pray that everyone here would recognize our need to grab the branch. We don't have to have all our questions answered. We don't even have to know what's gonna to come tomorrow, but we, we just need to surrender and know that on a present course, we're not gonna make it. That we'll surrender to you, place our faith in Christ as the savior of mankind. As we take these elements, have your way with us. May Christ be exalted. May your Holy Spirit have freedom. And may we be people of deep, deep faith. We ask it for our betterment. We ask it for your sake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.